know, they take that off of a, um, the revised common lectionary. Um, every Sunday there is a reading from the Old Testament, a psalm or a psalter is what they call it, and two gospel lessons. And on Thursday, I had a district cabinet meeting um, at, at Central High on Thursday, and um, that's a group of clergy people, a few lay people in our district superintendent. We spend all day from 8 o'clock in the morning um, from the, during the afternoon um, just talking and, and, and just building a relationship and, and decide, trying to be disciples ourselves. And um, somebody had talked about the lectionary for this week in Matthew chapter 5. And uh, verse, we can start at verse 13. And I read it, and I, you know, it's Communion Sunday, so you know, I, I don't really preach a whole message on Communion Sunday because of time. Um, and and, and the, the reading is actually 13 through 20, but I, don't, I think we're probably only going to get to 16 today. Um, but I, I read it Thursday in the meeting, and uh, the Lord just really spoke to me. On this piece of scripture. So we're going to do that. Um, and I think we're going to really tie it into communion. Um, you know, communion, I, I don't always work this way, but I like to tie and tie in a meaning when we do communion to communion, not just simply do it as a tradition, but tie in a meaning of something we can focus on while we, while we have communion. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So, I'm going to try to do that today. But I, you know, last week I think it was, you know, I preached on a subject that I, on a text that I preached on before because several people had asked me about this same verse. Well, it's the, kind of the same thing with communion today. That I've had several people say, why don't we celebrate communion? What is communion? And so I want to talk about that a minute. And it ties all in with, with the message today. But the communion um, celebration was, is, it, or is a um, remembrance of what Christ did with his disciples um, right before um, he went to the cross. And it was on Passover. He, it was the Passover supper is what they did. Um, and that's normally where a lot of people's knowledge ends. Well, what is the Passover supper? It's something that Jews still celebrate today. And, and honestly, if you want the truth about it, we should celebrate it too. I, I believe that. Amen. Um, it's not a law thing. And it's, it, it's just it's just good. And, here, and here's why. Passover supper is a remembrance itself of something that happened um, in Exodus when God told Moses to go to Pharaoh and say, let my people go. Remember that story? Yeah. And so, and if Pharaoh said no, then different plagues would come until Pharaoh said yes, correct? Well, Pharaoh had said no. And so, what ended up happening was God told Moses to tell the people to take a lamb, a spotless lamb, which would be perfect. Slaughter it. Boil the flesh. Eat it. And take the blood of the lamb and put it on the doorpost. Remember? Mm -hmm. Because that night, the angel of death would come and was going to kill the firstborn of every household. But when the angel of death would come to a house that had the blood of the lamb on the doorpost, the angel would know and see and would pass over that house and go to the next house. Um, and then as you know, right, that, that happened. And then the Israelites were quickly told to get out with all our stuff. Go. <laughs> right? Get out. Um, and not one Israelite family was touched. Okay. Now, the disciples sitting at the table, just, just for a moment, here's the thing. Let's go back to say. One of the things I love to do, and I really think is a key to receive revelation about the word. Especially if you're one that really knows the word and you read and don't get revelation anymore because you've read it so much. 
Try to put yourself in the position of the people that the story is talking about. Mm -hmm. try, to, try to look at it through their eyes. So for a moment, think of having a, celebrating the Passover supper with Jesus. Now the disciples were Jews, so they knew the story of Passover very, very well. Right? I mean, they were Jews, so they had been they had been taught this and listening to this all their lives. And this was not the first Passover they ever celebrated. I, I, I'm actually pretty sure that they had celebrated Passover a couple times with Jesus. This was the third time. Maybe his ministry was well that that was a reach right there. Um, but this Passover supper, Jesus has been talking crazy. He's been talking about he was going to have to die. And he's going to have to suffer and all of this stuff. And so the disciples were a little upset with him for, for saying those things. Um, and, and, and it's evidence right after when um, they come to get Jesus. And was it Peter that cut, cut off Peter? So no, Peter still wasn't accepting. He was in denial, right? Still wasn't accepting what was going on. But, um, Imagine being one of the disciples, a Jew, knowing this story intimately well. And Jesus starts this Passover. And you know it hits you. Wow. I'm sitting at the Passover feast with the Passover lamb. I'm sitting with the sacrifice God sent, who just happens to be himself. And he's spotless and he's perfect. He's without sin. But he's about to become the sacrifice for my sin and everyone else's sin. And then Jesus takes bread and says, eat this. This is my body. Disciples knew exactly what he was talking about. And he said, this is my blood. What does that mean to us today? Well, it means the same thing that it meant back in, in Moses' day. It, meant, it means that when the angel of death comes, he passes over us. Well, but Jeff, I still, we, we still die. Well, not really. Death, in its real definition, from a Christian standpoint, is separation from God. That's that's uh that's the real definition of death. That's real death. That's that, that that's actually what hell is. Did you know that? Yeah. Hell is actually eternal separation from God. Now you can get into the whole fire and the brimstone and stuff, and the Bible tells us that it's there. But I, but I think even worse than that is knowing that you have to spend eternity and you're completely cut off from God, yeah. with no hope of ever being reconciled. That's death. Life, then, is the exact opposite, which is what? Relationship with him. Fellowship with him. And it, it doesn't start in eternity. I mean, eternity started when I got born again. It, it don't start when I pass from this life to the next. It, it started the day that I got life. Because the Bible said I was dead in my trespasses until I got made alive, until I got born again, right? So I was dead. Why? Because I was cut off. But I got born again. Now I'm in relationship with him and now I have life. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. I've said this many, many times before, but Muhammad don't do it. Buddha don't do it. Uh, it's just Jesus. That's the only way. There is no other way. Um, I, I, you know, I said this at Rosedale, but I, I don't want to. I'm going to have to say this here. You don't have to pray for yourself for this. Today is the one year anniversary of my aunt Marjorie dying. Right? She died a year ago today. Um, Moving. But if you believe what I just said, 
that means she's actually more alive than I am. Amen. I believe that. Why? Because she's physically in the presence of God at all times. She's in heaven. She's with him. So if you, if you believe the book, then you're happy. It doesn't mean that I don't experience human emotion and grief and feelings and all that junk that I hate. Um, we do, and, and it's legitimate. We should. It's okay. But in my heart of hearts, the real me, if I believe the book, means that I'm rejoicing for her yeah. because she's more alive actually than I am. And what she's experienced and is experiencing is my hope. Because if I don't have that hope, then I'm just going to go home. <laughs> Why are we here? I could have slept with this man. So, in a brief nutshell, the celebration of, of communion is a celebration of life. It's a celebration that when the angel of death roams about the earth, he has to pass over me. He can't touch me. He's not allowed to. I think in the spirit world, when the angel of death was moving through to kill the, the firstborn of every Israelite, you know that also included livestock? Yeah. It wasn't just people. It also included livestock. Mm -hmm. I mean, God does something. He does it all the way. Um, I think when the angel of death was roaming about Egypt at that time, I think at, it was at night, which means it's really dark, right? I mean, angels may have night vision. I don't know. But it was really, really dark. It wasn't even street light. So he's rolling through. But I think that blood was like a beacon. It said, hey, you can't come here because here's where the blood of the lamb resides. You can't, you can't come here. You're not welcome. And in fact, you have no power here. Because the Almighty has said you don't. Likewise, I think I walk through this earth. And every demon and devil that I come across sees something going psh, psh, like one of those big billboard signs, you know? Hey, the blood of the lamb resides here. You have no power here. You can't touch it. Amen. And then I'm, I'm able to walk this earth without fear. I can preach the gospel in India while they're cutting heads of chickens off and trying to cast spells on them. And I can just look at them smile and say, Jesus loves you too. They end up driving. Why? Because it's a beacon. And in fact, they're doing all of that crazy junk because I have the beacon. Um, I know we get in some weird teachings that say, well, you got to be careful with who you're around and, and what house you're going to because stuff can get on you and blah, blah, blah. I, you know, right, I, I Reinhard Bonnke talks about that, and, and Reinhard said, um, I have slept in a hotel room in Africa where witch doctors have stayed all night casting spells on me. He said, do you know what happened? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> he said, because I have the blood of the lamb on me, and I'm immune. Amen. And I think sometimes our belief in stuff gives power to things that otherwise would never happen. Amen. I'm protected from the angel because I'm I, that 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 angel of death and all of that decay and, and nastiness and stuff. I mean, one of the names of Satan is Beelzebub, right? And that means what? The Lord of the Flies. But what is flies attracted to? Death, decay, nastiness. Therefore, the opposite is him. Mm -hmm. Light, pure, holy, wonderful. I'm concealed from this stuff so the old nasty stuff can't get to me either. Right? Amen. 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 I just thought that that was for somebody to say. Because, you know, you get in all weird kind of stuff. People will speak stuff over you and you need to do this or something like that's going to happen. And, and you, you know what? I don't have to be afraid. Satan's a cut off with and vine and flow from the source and there ain't nothing he can do about it. Amen. 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 And the source lives in me. So, I'm, I, I, you know, y'all know I talk about Smith Wigglesworth a lot, right? In one of his books, he wrote, 
He, he woke up one night, or something woke him up, and he turned around and looked, and there was some big, huge, snarling demon right at his, right there in his face. And he looks at him and goes, oh, it's just you, and turns around and goes back to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> he knows Smith knew. He didn't get into, into, into intercession. He didn't go into some, you know, craziness. He didn't call the pastor and say, come anoint me, come get the prayer chain going because I'm under an attack. He just said, and turned around and went back to sleep. I like that. You know, when I hit my, my feet hit the ground every morning, I, I think Satan's a crap just yeah. <laughs> I wish he'd go back to sleep. I'm going to up again. Exactly. And the phone goes dialing that 911. <laughs> That's just my rebellious spirit going on. Like, no, I just like being right. <laughs> Somebody told me one time, he said, you'd walk uphill in the snow both ways just for the opportunity that you might think you would be able to fight. That's still the same. <laughs> I'll go all the way to the other side of the world just, just to displace powers of darkness. I just will. Yeah. All right, let's, let's get to why we're really here today. Um, Matthew chapter 5. And this goes along right with the text. It goes along right with the text, guys. Right, right, right what I've just been talking about. It's all put together. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on the hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Let's stop right there. Again, you have to put yourself as one of the people that are listening to this. Now, this is actually part of, the, of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Um, this is right after the Beatitudes. You know, blessed are, blessed are, blessed are, blessed are. Well, this is right after that. If the guys and the, and the ladies here listening to Jesus speak would have known exactly what Jesus meant. Us, on the other hand, lose, lose something because of salt. Back then, salt was worth more than gold. People were paid in salt. You could actually barter with salt. Did you know that? That's where you get the term, is, are you worth your salt? Or are you worth your money? Are you worth what we pay you? It was, it was worth, salt was worth a lot. It was very scarce. They don't have, they didn't have big salt mines like they did today. And actually in that part of the world, and it still goes on today, um, Arabs uh, mined salt in the desert in big slabs and put it on the backs of camels and walked it into town and sell it. But the ancients knew in this time, they, they, they didn't know why, but they knew that salt was necessary for life. You have to have salt to live. If you don't have salt, you will die. Um, it's not a problem in our world today because we eat too much salt because salt is massively commercially mined now. America has huge salt deposits. So it's not a big deal for us today. Therefore, we lose the context of this text. But it's like Jesus was saying, you are the million dollar bill in the economy. Each one of you are a million dollar bill. Because I guarantee you the people that were listening to this, some of them had salt in their money belts. Mm -hmm. Salt, some copper. Because salt was currency back then. They also knew it was necessary for life. So Jesus was telling them, hey guys, you are a necessary nutrient to sustain life on this planet. Because without you, separation from God takes place, and that is death. But discipleship, Jesus Christ, is life. You are a necessary nutrient for people to understand who they really are and to have life. He's talking to the church. He's talking to you today. <coughs> Do you get that so far? You get it? 
Salt is very important. I mean, basically, the body is an electrical engine. Right? Philip knows this. He's a, he's a paramedic. Your nerves, your muscles, and all fire work using electricity. Your body creates it. Salt is the electrolyte that makes that happen. When that dies out, you die. You know, salt is a rock. Right? It's a rock. It's made up of sodium and chloride. When sodium and chlorine are combined, it makes salt. It just so happens that sodium by itself is dead. Chlorine by itself, we know, is bleach. So we go, go, don't do this. Don't. Do not try this at all. But if you drink a bottle of bleach, oh my you're going to die. But combine them together, and it's a necessary nutrient for life. You can't live without it. Then Jesus says something crazy. But if the salt loses its flavor, have you ever tasted flavorless salt? <laughs> you have? Well, I'm talking about real salt. Real salt. Not not salt, not salt substitute. That's just weird. That's just strange. What does that mean? It means it's abnormal. It's not the normal Christian life to turn your back on your first love. On the one who loved you most. It's not normal. It's abnormal. It's strange. It's weird. It, it's a blasphemy almost. I mean, it, it's just, it's, it's craziness for those who have really tasted the goodness of the Lord to turn around and lose your flavor, so to speak. Right? Do you get it? Let me ask you this question. What is the church's main responsibility? What is the church's main goal in, in the world today? The law. In short, it means make disciples. I mean, I think that scripture in Matthew 28, Jesus said, go out into all the world and make converts. Right? Oh, well, that's not what he said. What he said. That he said, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. So, really, we're here to make disciples. The only way you can make disciples is if you're a disciple yourself. And disciples make disciples. So a question was asked me this week, what do disciples look like? And when I read this passage, the Lord just spoke to me and said, this is what a, this is what a disciple looks like. Salt and light. That's what a disciple looks like. Well, Jeff, the church really should just concentrate on being the love of Christ in the world. That sounds good, don't it? That, that's something good to put on a, on a billboard or on a, on a mailer to mail out, right? Being the love of Christ in the world. Well, what about, though, no, Jeff, what we really should do is be a shining light in this dark world. That, that would look good on the internet, on the Facebook page, you know, that big little slogan, right? Those are methods, but they're not the end. The end is to make disciples. And I think part of the church's decline, especially in the last 200 years, and more especially in the last since, since the 50s, has been because we've abandoned our primary function, and that is making disciples of Jesus Christ, because discipleship takes work, and we don't want to do work, and we don't even want to be disciples ourselves. And we, we get off-footed, we get afraid of being salt and being light, because we don't feel like we're salt and light, because all we see are our mistakes. And God is saying, I know what I created you for, I know what's inside you, you are salt and light. Don't worry about what you can see, only worry about what I tell you to do and go do, not out of works, but because you love me and I love you, and then watch the powers of darkness flee from your very presence. Because now you're about his business. And I think
think that's a big part of our decline is we've stopped making disciples because we've stopped being disciples. And instead, we've traded our discipleship for church membership. <laughs> that's bad. And we've turned the church from a, a, a trauma unit in a forward war zone to a country club where we sit and we, we admire each other's holiness. And we'll do a fundraiser every now and then, and we'll give something to the poor, and, and you know, and, and as long as the poor stay out there and don't come in here because they don't look like us, they don't smell like us either. And as long as we don't, you know, they stay over there and we stay here, we'll do a little bit for them every now and then. But this is our church. Come on. This is our church. We only want people that looks like that look like us, dress like us, smell like us, talk like us. We don't want nobody else because they may bring embarrassment to us. Come on, yeah, I'm meddling now. I need to go home and put some put some stuff on your toes. <laughs> this is a steel toed boots only place. I'm just telling you, I just, I just think that that's, that's our problem. Huh. We've traded church, we've traded discipleship for church membership and it's the same thing. It's not. We, we, we've traded discipleship for a good year in before the tithing statement and think that that means I'm a good discipleship. I'm, I'm a good disciple because I gave a lot of money. Discipleship's all about being the salt and being the light. Let me tell you something about light. Light is not an absence of darkness. Darkness is just an absence of light. Light always chases away the darkness. The darkness can never overwhelm the light. It's not like I walk into a pitch black room and I have a flashlight that I have to do something to keep it moving and the darkness is going to overtake the flashlight and it won't work anymore. Is that right? Is that how it, well, that's not how it works. Well, well, how's it work? I, wherever I shine the flashlight, there's the light and the darkness runs away from it. Right? Jesus said, let your light so shine before men. Here's the deal. Here's the picture. Your friends that aren't saved and just people you don't even know or watching you walk into a dark, dark place. Number one, we'd just be better off by some of us attempting to walk into a dark, dark place. Most of us won't because we're scared of stuff to get on us. And we can't deal with it. <laughs> but I'm light. The dark can't get on me. Walk into a pitch black, dark place, right? And folks are looking at me. What's he going to do? Church folk usually run when they see dark like this. And wherever I shine my light, the darkness runs away. Because, see, here's the key. The people that are lost that's watching you shine your light to the darkness, they're scared of the darkness, too. They just have nothing to overcome it with. But they see you walk in and the darkness run from your very presence. They're going to be like, I want what he's got. Amen. Boom. Another disciple. What causes light, especially in this time? What did they have flashlights and light bulbs back then? Uh, and candles. What's the can? How does the candle operate? Well, how does that operate? What is that? Light. Yeah, fire. Fire. Fire means light. God didn't set you on fire for Him so He can cover you up and nobody will ever see that light. Fire gives off light. You've got the fire of the Holy Ghost in you to shine in the dark places. Amen. Period. The end. Go shine in dark places. Just go do it. Man, when I first went to India, before we went, people all over told me I wasn't ready to go. Told me all over I wasn't ready to go. The, the two, two folks that was kind of helping us in ministry and kind of poured into us told me that God's not even in India. <laughs> <laughs> them, them demons are going to eat you up if you go over there. I'm scared. 
I will allow this area to be blocked. It was blocked. When I went, even though I was scared, wherever I turned and shone my light, darkness ran away. And somehow, all of a sudden, I learned that when I walk into a place, I'm in control. They obey me. Well, it's really God who's obeying. No, he gave me his authority. Amen. Not to be praying and begging for him to do stuff. He said, I'll give it to you. You go do it. Yeah. Jesus said, you go heal the sick. Cleanse the lepers, bring the dead, cast out demons. Freely you've received, so you go freely give it. That'd be like me when I was a cop. I've said this before. When I was a cop, I, if I caught a bank robber, I would say, now wait here. i got to call the sheriff so he can come arrest you. Because <laughs> he's the one that was elected that has the authority. No, I had this thing in my wallet that said, David. Jeffrey D. Treherne has been, has been given the authority to conduct arrest and conduct, to make arrests and conduct investigations in the name of the sheriff of Jackson County. I didn't have to wait for somebody to do it myself because I had been given the authority. Yeah. Same thing with us. He's given us authority. We just go do. So, Jeff, I don't, I don't, I don't feel like I'm solving the light. I don't either. <laughs> so what? <laughs> it's pretty much right. So what? I don't go by my feelings. I only go by my word, word of God. Yeah. Yeah. Not the iPad, just the Bible that's on my iPad. <laughs> that's what I go by. Well, Jeff, I, I don't feel like I'm worth that much. I know, but come on, just accept it as true and move on. change of heart and change of life. It's changing from an agent of darkness to salt and light. It's not that you have a flashlight, you are light. It's not that you've been given a flashlight and when it's inconvenient, you can turn it off and not use it. No, you are light, you become light. Father, we thank you for uh, this word. Father, I pray as, as, as a pastor, Lord, that, that this word falls on good ground. Lord, that the seed produces much fruit for your glory. Father, I pray that we really get a revelation down deep in our hearts that allows us to conquer fear, conquer low self-esteem, conquer self-worth issues, Father. And Lord, a, word, a, a revelation that conquers what others have said about us to our face and even behind our back, Father. That we step in today into our true destiny, and that is salt and light. Father, let us realize that because of you who lives in us, that we are a necessary nutrient to sustain life on this planet. Father, we're more valuable than gold. Father, we're more valuable than, than, than anything to advance this plan of yours, to advance the gospel. We're your agents. Father, I pray that we get a revelation that we are light. We've become it. Lord, that some of us have put on self-imposed lampshades. And, and Father, I just pray they rip apart right now in the name of Jesus. Father, let our light so shine before men. For every, everywhere we go, Lord, let us understand that we are the, 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 the tempo setters. We are the thermostat. We set the temperature. Father, let us be the light to shine forth in the wicked world. And let others see that light and become it themselves. Father, we thank you and we give you praise. And it's in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Amen.